he even had policies that I think showed a tremendous capacity to imagine. He had policies that really attacked serious problems in his day. Look at his energy policy. Do you know that President Ford's energy policy first was announced in the State of the Union in 1975? Now let me just give you a few statistics about this because I think you will be shocked. Could we shut that door, please? Thank you. President Ford said he would not sit by and watch the nation continue to talk about an en energy crisis and do nothing about it, nor would he accept halfway measures which failed to change the basic direction that our nation uh, had been going in, which made America so vulnerable to foreign oil shocks. The president proposed firm but necessary measures to designed to achieve energy independence for the U.S. by 1985 and to regain world leadership in energy. Now this is in his 1975 State of the Union address. Think of this. He wanted energy independence by 1985. At that time, in 1975, the average cost of imported crude oil was 10 bucks a barrel. Think of that, it's 140 today. 10 bucks a barrel. That's when we still had time to do a lot of things to uh, forestall a lot of problems that we would have later. He proposes as early as 1975 the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. It was President Ford who had the imagination to see the value of that so that we would have an emergency stock of oil. If the rest of the world cut it off, we'd at least be able to, to meet our basic defense needs and provide enough oil for maintaining peace and order domestically. He also said that we needed to have major investment in alternative fuels, solar, wind energy, geothermal energy, all of those that, you know, not just the oil shales in Colorado and that kind of thing. Uh, he, he did want, it is true, a vast expansion of oil, um, uh, oil conversion from coal and from oil shale. He also wanted to expand nuclear technology. That scared a lot of Americans, but realize that other countries had been developing nuclear power, France, for example, unabated. They didn't have a three-mile island. Now, one of the things the French did was that they put their nuclear power plants on the Rhine River, so if there was a problem, all the nuclear fallout would go into Germany. This would be major payback for World Wars <laughs> I and II. But they were developing their technology. Nuclear technology came to a screeching halt in the United States. Ford said, you know, we better look at it. We don't want to be stuck in an energy crisis where we're dependent on unstable sources of foreign oil. He saw it. Uh, he also proposed major conservation programs at the Carter administration. Uh, tax breaks, for example, if you insulated your house, if you put solar panels on for your wa hot water heater. This all started with Ford, you know, 33 years ago. Uh, he said that um, he also wanted uh, to have compulsory mileage standards for U.S. automobiles. He was the first president to say, you know, we, Detroit had better become very innovative. And of course, I hate to say this because I'm speaking in Michigan, I'm speaking in the auto capital of the world here, but it was the Michigan delegation which led resistance to Ford for any cafe standards and that kind of thing. Well, the Japanese said, great, you guys go ahead and do that. We will adapt our technologies to your market, and they took advantage of it in a way that we, shame on us, we should have been ahead of the curve there. Japanese took us to school. And we're still paying for some of those decisions. I mean, look at all the people, you, you've been reading the Detroit Free Press, the Detroit News, and all the people driving the SUVs and the trucks now who say, gosh, what were we thinking in the 90s when we went on this most recent spree? Ford called for zero oil imports by 1985. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of numbers. In 1975, we imported 5 million barrels a day. Do you know how many million barrels a day we import now? 15 million barrels of oil a day. Now, three times. Yes, three times. And economists project that if Ford's energy proposals had been implemented, the cost of a barrel of oil today would be only $20 because of the demand. I, I 
I think that might be a little bit low because of China and India, but still, you, you see what I mean? About $120 less than what it is today. Vision. I'm talking about vision. I'm talking about healing the country through the presidency, reestablishing trust in the presidency and the office and this major, this most powerful institution in the world. I'm talking about the long-term promise of this nation. But I'm also talking about the short-term policies. Ford had the imagination to grasp where this country had to go. He had the qualities of a statesman in terms of his imagination. Yes, ma'am. Why didn't the legislature adopt any of these things? Well, you, these are wonderful ideas. What happened to them? Because... Uh, I understand the automobile company. The lobbyists right. who uh, fought for uh, basically the oil industry um, basically won the debate, and they were able to prevail so that we would remain dependent on Not oil. Not much has changed. Not much has changed. <clears throat> yes, sir. I think I have a, one reason for why uh, the, uh, we, we did not do what, you're, what Ford told them to do, because we were in an economy, like when I was younger, if, if, a, if a company didn't do well for six months, they didn't go broke, they just did better the next six months. But now, if a company doesn't, well, doesn't do well in four months, they get rid of, they get rid of the, the uh, we're in a market system, you gotta do well immediately. Yes. And every four months you gotta make more profit than the guy before. That's true. You. That's true. That's, that's a very I good observation. That, that ruined us. Wow. I think a market system was wonderful for competition, but it's gotta be something up above, gotta keep you from doing the wrong things. <laughs> yeah, well. I think we've learned our lesson on oil because we are so vulnerable. It's been driving our foreign policy in ways that perhaps we now are questioning. The second quality that I mentioned that a statesman has is passion. Now, remember I said when I first laid this out from Thucydides and Plutarch and some of the other ancient writers, that passion doesn't always mean, oh, well, I'm you know, a passionate person and I'm embracing romanticism and I'm, uh, it bubbles to the surface and I'm exuberant. Passion is the fire in the belly. It's what's inside a man or a woman. And you can't always see that, but it expresses itself in very interesting ways. One way that you see a person's passion is in their ambition, their, their proper ambition not the over-vaulting ambition that Shakespeare warns us about, but a proper ambition to get things done. And Ford had quite a bit of ambition. If you look at what he did, he wasn't content just to be a kid playing marbles out on the playground. He wanted to be a Boy Scout and stand out from the crowd. He wasn't content just to be a Boy Scout. He had to be an Eagle Scout. He wasn't content just to be an Eagle Scout. He wanted to be part of the elite honor guard up on Mackinac Island. That gives you a hint of what's to come in Ford's life. Look at him as a football player. At South High School in Grand Rapids, he didn't want to just watch football or be JV. He wanted to get on the team, be a football player, and he wanted to be the best he could, and he's voted the, most, the best football player in the state um, in 1930. So that's Ford's, you know, he's not content just to play football, he's got to be the best. He goes to the University of Michigan on the luckiest break of his life. He doesn't just want to be on the team, he's a center, he also plays defense. He is going to be the most valuable player on the team of 1934 for the Wolverines. He goes into the Navy. He doesn't just want to uh, be in the Navy to say, I was in the Navy. When he was assigned for too long in North Carolina, and he didn't like his job there, and he wanted to get into the Pacific Theater and get into the action, he told his officers, send me to the action. He wanted to distinguish himself, and he went to the USS Monterey where he did distinguish himself. And so, here's again a guy who's striving 